this is the second of, uh, of, of, of the three presentations and is uh, about some of the practical reforms we've made. Um, I talked about the, the London Times having commissioned me to do this piece of work of adoption and that led um, the Secretary of State, uh, a man called Michael Gove, who's now moved from education to be Secretary of State of Justice, but he was the minister throughout the coalition government. That led him to asking me to come in as an advisor, not as a civil servant, I used to be a civil servant, but as an outside advisor uh, on adoption to see whether or not uh, we could do more to make sure that the children who needed adoption uh, would get adoption. And uh, these are the priorities that uh, uh, I, I set out for and were accepted by uh, ministers in the UK. Uh, looking at adoption breakdown, uh, looking at the recruitment of adopters, uh, trying to re reduce delay in a process which was so incredibly slow, and crucially, avoiding targets. But let me start with the adoption breakdown. So when I did this piece of work for the, the, the Times, um, I was told by so many people that uh, part of the problem with adoptions was that so many of them broke down and that the consequences of an adoption breakdown was so severe for the, the child, which of course they are. So the Guardian, which is a, a, a left-wing national newspaper in the UK, dis described adoption breakdowns as being about 20%. The British Association of Adoption and Fostering, the primary charity, which is a, a think tank and pressure group on behalf of adoption and fostering, also said that the breakdown, said the breakdown was about 20%. Action for Children used to be known as NCH, National Children's Home. Uh, the, the second biggest children's charity in the UK, but the biggest in terms of actually managing and placing children for adoption, said that the breakdown was between 25 and 30%. Actually, what I found was that we didn't have enough research to tell us what the answer is, but certain pieces of research made those estimates of 20, 20 or 25% most unlikely. And uh, I found, I should say, throughout this process, I kept coming across research which had been peer-reviewed of outstanding quality, which seemed to have very little impact on practice. Uh, and I came across two pieces of work uh, here. The first one by Quinton Rushton Dance and Maze, 2001, so it was a few years old by the time <coughs> I saw it. But this looked at 61 very challenging children. As you can see, all came from very difficult family backgrounds, uh, marital difficulties, mental illness, poverty, a history of abuse and neglect. And the children had had frequent attempts had been made to rehabilitate them back with their birth families. Uh, they were all a little older and they were considered very, very challenging. But after one year of those 61 placements, so I missed a, a rather crucial figure out of there, it should say only three, only three of the 61 placements had disrupted. And then in 2006, one of the same authors, uh, Rushton, uh, again with Dad in 2006, took a much longer term study, followed children between five and 11, and as you'll know, there's a uh, uh, a significant uh, correlation between the age of the child and, the, and the, the extent to which the adoption is likely to be challenging. This followed children aged 5 to 11. All of the children seen as challenging, not just because of their age, but because of their previous background and multiple placements uh, and things like that. All followed until the 14th birthday. And the disruption rate here by the 14th birthday was 23%. So still very high for that group, some might say unacceptably high, although clearly uh, most of those children were adopted successfully. But I felt sure that if only 23% of this very challenging group were having their adoptions break down, the overall estimates of between 20 and 30% for adoption more generally uh, couldn't be right. Uh, and I did a, a, a bit of a straw poll from practitioners. It lacked any sort of uh, of validity in terms of research methodology. But I, I hazarded a, uh, an estimate that adoption disruption rate might be close to 10%. But my first recommendation to government was that they commission research to establish the truth. 
and uh, a, a woman called Professor Judy Selwyn, who people in the room have met and has been my uh, guru throughout this process. She's at the University of Bristol. She conducted, uh, finished research late last year on uh, adoption breakdown and found that the rate <coughs> was lower than I uh, expected. Only 3% of adoptions were found to have broken down. Although, and this is very, very important, uh, Professor Savoy acknowledged that uh, there were only so few adoptions because adopters appeared to be a remarkably resilient group of people, and she estimated about a quarter of adoptions were struggling. But nevertheless, in terms of breakdown, a much smaller number than before. So one of the reasons which were encouraging practitioners not to pursue adoption, and for some local authorities not to, uh, some cities and towns in England where there were virtually no adoptions at all, was predicated on false assumptions about the success of adoption. The second area was adopter assessment, which uh, was just dreadful. Uh, I spent, um, as part of my process trying to understand this, I spent about six weeks working in one area of the UK. I went to an area in South East England, uh, the county of Kent, uh, and I worked in the county council there, and uh, working very closely with the adoption team and following the adopter assessment process. Um, I was genuinely staggered at how awful it was. Uh, when I was going along to the first meeting, what was known as the adoption panel, where recommendations from social workers would be considered by a panel of their people as to whether it could be approved for adoption. Uh, there were three sets of adopters being considered. And uh, I knew something wasn't quite right when the papers for that meeting were delivered to, to me in County Hall in Maidstone and Kent. They were delivered to me in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> the papers were so voluminous, uh, uh, more than uh, 100, 120 pages on each of them. Uh, uh, so although there was a huge amount of time that went into these reports, uh, they uh, had more in weight than they had in uh, analysis. They were very, very poor. And uh, any suggestion that uh, the time taken to complete these assessments might be accelerated was greeted very uh, negatively. And uh, I was forever being told that I was asking people to, to rush assessments. Uh, uh, I also found that as I looked across England at different towns and cities, different local authorities, that there were astonishing differences in productivity. And I use this vulgar word intentionally. It sometimes upsets uh, some childcare professionals, uh, and I use it, I use it almost in, intentionally to challenge them, but I did find that I would look at local authorities with similar numbers of staff, similar numbers of children, uh, and some of them were running an adoptive assessment process much faster and producing many more adopters than equivalent authorities. Again, I hasten to add, not because in Kent, the county I work in where I saw such poor practice, not because people were lazy, it wasn't that people weren't working hard, they were working incredibly hard, but some of them were trying to take risk out of a process which could not be de-risked. They were following up such incredible detail about adopters that uh, it was remarkable that any people got through it. And I promise you I'm not making this up, but I found in these uh, hundred or more pages of adopters of assessment, one of the things which children's social care professionals were required to do was they had to go into the garden and see whether or not in the garden there was a trampoline. Uh, most unlikely in the British weather, but they had to see whether there or not in the garden there was a trampoline. And if there was a trampoline, they had to tick a box to say whether or not it had a safety net. That was the extent of trying to de-risk the process, which was one reason why it took so long. Uh, so it was very clear that we needed a new assessment process. And uh, the voluntary sector played a fantastic part in this. A group of children's charities, all adoption charities, all dealing with adoption, stepped forward and volunteered to redesign the system, uh, which the government uh, enthusiastically uh, accepted. And I'll come on a little, a little bit later about how that was speeded up somewhat, but it, it wasn't just the fact that the process took so long. It was a fact that for would-be adopters, the process 
uh, was so unwelcoming. And lots of adopters uh, gave up before becoming approved. Uh, I found that local authorities and some voluntary adoption agencies, it was not at all unusual for them not to respond to initial inquiries. Would be adopters would have to phone over and over again and almost harass their way to being uh, considered. And then when prospective adopters were in the process, they reported over and over again that sometimes they were given no sense of when the process would end. That it just went on and on. Lots of adopt would be adopters just gave up. Uh, they found the process too difficult to go through. Uh, they found, felt that they were treated unsympathetically. And of course this process is not for the adopters, it's for children. But if you want to find good prospective carers for children, then it's a good idea to treat them with some care and some enthusiasm. Uh, and there was a rush of books published about this period from people, many of whom I've met, who would have been very, very effective adopters for children in the UK, but gave up in the process and adopted from places like Guatemala and Mexico because they were so, uh, found the process so very, very difficult. Um, in terms of timeliness, as you can see here, when I talk about local authorities incident, I'm talking about um, the administrations of towns and cities in England. Uh, government guidance said that the decision whether or not to pursue adoption for a child needed to be taken within six months of a child coming into care. Only one local authority was managing that in 2010. It was just something which was just, it was routinely ignored. Uh, and once adoption was decided upon, which should happen at the six month stage, uh, the guide suggests that char a, child, a child should be placed with adopters within 12 months, and only 28% of authorities uh, managed to do that. And I think one reason for this was that the sense of urgency about what to do with a child was lost once they entered care. There was a general sense of relief that the child was safe, they were in foster care, and there didn't need to be any rush. And certainly, all the evidence about the effect of lack of stability, uh, about indeed about attachment theory, about the need to try to place children in their permanent homes as early as possible, was lost as this system trundled on. And uh, although in many cases these children were being well cared for in, in care, it meant that many of them waited far too long for the adoption which eventually came. And some children, not an insignificant number, essentially grew out of the option of being adopted. Now, uh, the numbers have, partly because of uh, 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 the assessment process, the numbers have increased considerably, from 3,000 2010-11 to 5,300 last year. So that's a very significant increase, about 73%. I should mention that those numbers will fall shortly. Uh, with, there's a, a, a problem at court in England uh, about uh, adoption, which will need um, some legislation to fix, and the Prime Minister announced last week that he's going to do that, and the numbers will recover. Again, I'm confident about that. But the, the, this changeover three years, as you can see, has been very significant. Uh, and the adopter recruitment drive has uh, been the main reason for that. And uh, one of the most pleasing aspects of that is that the number of children with a placement order, that's a court decision that adoption is the right disposal for the child, which was just growing year on year, has at last begun to fall. In part because of the slowdown in children being selected for adoption, but it goes much further than that. So the number of children who adoption is considered the right option where the court has determined that those children should be adopted has fallen very, very significantly. And we now, for the first time in living memory, we have more approved adopters waiting for children than we have children waiting for adoption, which is a much healthier state of affairs. And uh, delay has become much less of an issue. Uh, 50% of adopters are now approved within six months. Previously, uh, fewer than 50% got to the adoption panel, that's the, the lay body which makes the final decision, within eight months. So we've improved things uh, uh, considerably there. But the average, this is still working out, the average is still 232 days, and I'm quite sure we can do better than that. 
and then we'd have to do much more about the time between a group of adopters, a couple or an individual being approved and being matched to the child. That still takes six months and uh, it can certainly be improved because some local authorities uh, have matched a child with approved adopters within a few weeks. But nevertheless, the average time between a child entering care and moving in with the family who will be their adopters uh, is now 500 days instead of 656. And the 500 days would be a much smaller number. It's, a, it's a, an inflated number because as we've got more adopters, uh, some of the children who have been waiting for adoption for a long time are at last being adopted. And of course, that has affected the statistics because they've been waiting a long time. So we've seen quite significant increases in timeliness, which means the children are getting stability, moving in with the people who parent them forever at a much earlier age, and all the evidence suggests that those adoptions will be much easier to manage uh, because of that. But we could do much better than this. This is no, by no means uh, the end of the issue, and the, uh, our Prime Minister last week uh, just made it very plain in a, a speech he made on Monday that he wanted to see uh, much further improvements. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, absolutely no targets for adoption, and uh, despite a number of ministers thinking that might be uh, a useful thing to do, and I, I have to say that generally speaking, I'm, I'm very much a targets man, I like targets for all sorts of things, and targets change things, but targets will be quite wrong here. Tony Blair, our Prime Minister between 1997 and 2010, did for a few years introduce adoption targets. They were um, hugely well-intentioned, uh, they were misinterpreted, and I think to some extent adoption was undermined by those targets. Um, lots of critics believe that children were being selected for adoption to meet targets rather than it being the right thing for them. So we've absolutely avoided them. We've improved adoption in terms of number of adopters, number of children adopted and timeliness by simply sharing with local authorities statistics. We had virtually no data on any of this. When I started this in 2010, I didn't know how long children were waiting, uh, how long adopters waited. We just didn't have any data. We now have the data from all the local authorities in England to deal with adoption, and we've shared that between them. And actually, the sharing of that information between them has caused, uh, has helped to cause a significant improvement in timeliness. Uh, and this process more recently has been managed apolitically. We've tried to take politics out of adoption a little bit, but I think all the Adoption Leadership Board, and I'll say something about that in uh, a couple of slides' time. I want to make it very clear, I am not suggesting that we've got everything right yet in England. We, we're in a process and we've got much more to do. But we've got much, a lot of evidence that adopters feel much better uh, about the way that they're treated. It still takes a long time, and it's still an arduous process, and it should be. But doctors still find it invasive to talk about their loss. There's a very difficult transition for couples who are still dealing with the, the grief of lost pregnancies, the disappointment of IVF not working. They sometimes still complain that the system takes too long. Sometimes, for example, professionals will, will turn potential adopters away and ask them to come back in a year's time after they've come to terms with not being able to have a child naturally and so forth. And once the system starts, it can still be better. But adopters are treated uh, much better than they used to be, with much more consideration. And I think uh, local authorities have come to understand that actually if they want to find homes for difficult to place children, they have to be much more supportive and open the doors to many more potential adopters. Uh, significantly, uh, there's a much greater role now for adopters once qualified in terms of matching themselves with a child. And I'll say something about that in my third presentation. It's been a very difficult process to achieve that. Uh, still problems, uh, as I find in probing individual cases, uh, a process which will be uh, formalized shortly. But we've made some real progress. I think one of the reasons we've made the real progress is the adoption sector, the local authorities, the cities and towns who manage children's social services, and the voluntary sector uh, and academics 
come together and accepted an invitation from government ministers to form a thing called the Adoption Leadership Board, which I chair. Uh, I'm going to step down from that at the end of March simply because I've got other things to do and I've, adoption has pretty much taken over my life for about the last five years. But the fact that this is no longer managed politically has hugely helped. So for example, uh, we had a general election quite recently. It was quite clear I had discussions with uh, the, the potential secretaries of state who would have been responsible for childcare policy. Uh, all of them would have carried on the policy of trying to uh, make adoptions easier and to allow all children who needed for whom adoption was the best option to get adoption. And I think that was in part because it wasn't seen necessarily as just a policy of the last government. Uh, and uh, I think in terms of trying to persuade uh, local authorities that they can improve, of uh, boosting improved practice, of uh, trying to change practice in, for example, uh, adoption matching, the fact that the sector has taken charge, obviously ministers are still involved, and I, as chair of this board, report to ministers, but the fact that it's been led by the sector has been a very, very powerful development. And uh, it's made uh, some of the changes and some of the tricky problems much more deliverable. Uh, that's the end of part two, Jane. Again, I'd be to take questions or you're yeah. to.